answer, did they succeed or not? So it can be hard. And what was the probability of them moving the thing six inches by chance? It's, um, it can be a little tricky. But in general, it's fairly easy. Uh, and then you have to repeat the trial enough times to satisfy the testing organizations that you've actually demonstrated the power. And that means the probability of succeeding on all, all the trials has to be, quote, low. Uh, this seems fair, but I'm going to argue in a minute or two that uh, it's not really. So why isn't it fair? Well, before I do that, uh, let me explain why fairness is important. The applicant has agreed to some protocol. There are people who say, well, that's inherently fair. They agree, that's it. What more do you need? Well, the problem is that if they fail, they're going to start finding excuses. You can't stop that. You know they will have an excuse that was uh, too hot outside or something. But the testing organization should be prepared to, for as much of the possible excuses as possible. In particular, they should be prepared for weaknesses in the protocol. So they worked very hard to eliminate the possibility of cheating and that other weaknesses in the actual operation, but they could need to look at the statistics of the protocol as well. All right. Um, and finally, personally, I'm involved, as I said, with uh, the IIG's tests, and I don't want to participate if I don't think it's fair. They're fair. So, Fairness, I believe, is important to testing organizations. Now, what this leads to is something I call negotiating for the applicant. Applicants tend not to be very sophisticated in their statistics understanding. And if you're going, but when they fail, somebody else might come along who is sophisticated and say, well, this test wasn't fair because of the statistics. So you really need to look at the statistics from the applicant's point of view. And that leads to a few considerations. The first one, the most obvious one, is that nobody is perfect at anything. Um, I can ask you to uh, pick up a cup from the table, and 99% of the time you will do it without spilling the liquid. But Hey, I can tell you from personal experience that sometimes I spill the liquid. So nobody is perfect, and you have to allow for some failure on some trials. Now, um, how many of you saw either live or streamed uh, the test that that uh, at Tam about a month ago? Okay, a few of you. Um, at that test, they required the applicant to succeed on eight of nine trials. Um, there is no, they never explained how they picked eight of nine. And uh, there is an interesting uh, blog entry up on the JREF website where they, where Richard Saunders discusses the preliminaries and what they did before the test, and he doesn't explain how they picked eight out of nine. And uh, eight out of nine is a little inadequate, actually. I can go into more detail if you let me do some numbers later. Um, there is a way to do this in a reasonably sophisticated fashion, which is assume that if you're the applicant, assume that you have an imperfect power. You can succeed on 9 out of 10 trials. Now, applicants don't come and say they can succeed on 9 out of 10 trials, but as I said, I'm negotiating for the applicant. I'm saying what I would want if I were an applicant. And so I would 
want to know the probability, if I succeed on nine out of 10 trials, the probability I might fail by chance. Uh, the testing organization has figured out the probability I'd pass by chance, but what's the probability I'd fail by chance? And if that's not low, then I don't think it's a satisfactory fair test. Um, now, there's some other considerations about the probabilities that the testing organization might want to take into account. For example, what is the probability of what I call a near, net, near miss? The, um, the JREF test, as I said, required eight out of nine successes. Um, if the applicant had had seven successes, you know what they would say. They would say that, well, I really have demonstrated power. Maybe you aren't going to give me the prize. I agree that I had to get an eight out of nine, but they're going to say, you know they're going to say, I succeeded. I demonstrated the power. You, the testing organization wants to look at the probability that's going to happen. And if it's too high, it's a real problem for the testing organization. Uh, finally, I'm not going to explain this in much detail, but one can take a, an approach um, of Bayesian analysis here and determine whether if a particular result is um, conclusive, for the chance, or conclusive for the imperfect power, or kind of in the middle and inconclusive. And that's um, an alternative kind of analysis that, as I say, it's basically basic, and I'm not going to go into it. So the bottom line is, general is most of these considerations suggest increasing the number of trials. Um, this is sometimes not practical. Trials can, there are practical considerations in how long tests should go, and if you increase the number of trials, you make the test longer, and applicant gets tired, and so on. So I'm not advocating that these criteria be absolutely insisted on, but they should be considered by testing organizations. At least that's my claim. Now, I promise no numbers, but I have a I have a slide here that actually analyzes the Randy Tap challenge from last month. Let's show have a show of hands. Who wants to see it? The actual numbers? That's enough. <laughs> um, the probability of a success in a single trial here was 50%. Uh, it would have made a, required a somewhat more elaborate trial um, to reduce that, given the nature of, of the claim. Uh, it's not clear to me that if you have Increase, decrease the probability on the trial, it would have taken longer, and it might have been faster to do two trials of the form they did, rather than one with a lower probability. Um, at any rate, that's not, 50% tip is much higher than, in general, is desirable. The probability of getting eight out of nine correct by chance was 2% which for these things is pretty high. Um, I am not sure whether what Randy has said officially about how, what percent, what probability he expects from a, this, in case people don't understand the details. Um, the prize is awarded in, in order to win the prize, you have to do a preliminary demonstration and then an actual test. So the preliminary demonstration, which is what was going on last month, uh, the criteria for pro passing by chance is can be weakened. Uh, weakening it down to two percent is. I, I was surprised by that when I read the numbers. Uh, 
probability of a near near miss or near pass, which would have been seven out of eight, uh, seven out of nine is seven percent, which well again you can judge whether that's acceptable. Uh, the oops, sorry. Clicked on the wrong button. There we go. Okay. The final number here is the probability that you might fail with the reduced power if the claimant, if the applicant could have done his thing nine out of ten times, there's still a probability of failure of 23%. And if I was an applicant, I would consider that too high. And um, well, that's sort of the end. Uh, question. Yeah, I was there. The uh, two, I think it was TAM eight, where they had the woman who was also a trial Randy test, and they had one with a crystal. Connie son. Connie son. I don't remember. She yeah, she's from. Crystal over yeah. envelopes, but then the point is that Banachek administered the test, and her first complaint, the reason she failed, was that it was a magician. Can you describe the details of the, the, what was being tested? Um, this time? Yeah, this time? Did it? Uh, just I, I can't. That's not really the subject of this. But the power was, the claim power was that he could, by waving his hands and project some kind of frequency energy into somebody else's hand. And um, the test was basically the applicant did it. One did it, and then was it who did the other one? Uh, yeah. Jamie Swiss. Jamie Swiss would do it, and they randomly selected who would go first, and then the applicant had to say whether the first or the second attempt was the one with really with the power. So you had the same problem. Um, Maybe even Ian Swiss involved. In mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean the same problem that create excuses. No, that's all I'm saying. Uh, That's a valid criticism, not to have magicians involved in the testing process. If I were a claimant, I would have a problem with that because their total, you know, uh, career is deceiving people. Right. And people like Jamie and Swiss and Banachek, who worked for JREF, have a vested interest in the person losing. So we do not, the IIG does not use magicians in, as administrators of the test. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I would agree with, totally agree with what Jim said. It just wasn't the subject of this talk. Any other questions? Yeah. On the test, I always had a problem because it seemed like that they were trying to do one test to prove paranormal powers or not, and in science, you would never have blank tests that prove paranormal science powers. Um, Yes, this is not. This is I not a. These are not scientific experiments. They are prize tests, and that those that creates different uh, justifications, different properties. Um, I've been talking to one potential applicant recently, and about that, he wants to do a scientific experiment. I keep telling him no. We, you want to do a scientific experiment, go ahead, do it with some, one of your friends. Um, this is a prize test. Okay. Yeah. Well, just out of fairness to, to uh, just set the record straight, because since so few people here were actually at this last TAM, the applicant, um, uh, he was the one who decided who would be on the stage with him trying to see if they had the power or not. And he selected Jamie Swiss, who is a magician. He selected him as having no ability whatsoever. He said he had no, um, I don't know if it was chi or whatever he said. He said that this person right here is going to be a great control. I guess they used him as a control because he has no, no ability. So the claimant is the one who actually selected Jamie to do, uh, be a part of it. Now this, I, I don't know about, um, you know, I don't want to speak to whether they should have magicians or not. As the actual administrators, obviously we want to have magicians involved, 
because they're, you know, they're, they're looking for things that, that the normal scientists probably wouldn't know to look for. So that's, it's great to have uh, magicians on the protocol or something, but just not maybe, you know, in a place where they could pull out and say that they, that it was caused because of that. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, um, Mark Edward is a member of our team, and he's a value of magicians to guard against deception are, are very valuable to us. We just don't want them to be the ones touching the cards and things. And Susan's right, this guy was, uh, the, the, the applicant uh, pre-screened a bunch of different people to see if they were receptive to this power, but um, two years ago, I was one of the one of the, 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 the people who were pre-screened, and I made sure I got chosen. It was not a blinded test. I knew exactly what he was doing. I, I made it appear that the effect was working on me, so that I could be on stage. So, I mean, it's it's these people have no idea what what's you know what up what what was. Yeah, I, I would say that not using Jamie's Swiss as the uh, control would be something that would fall into the category of negotiating for the claimant. They ought to realize that they shouldn't allow the magician. Yeah, cause because Jamie could have been faking it. If he might, for example, the, the requirement was that the uh, woman be decide which of, whether it was the first one or the second one where the power was exercised. Well, who knows what magician trick Jamie Swiss might have used to make her think that he had the power. I don't know. Well, and it goes to anybody. It doesn't necessarily need to be a magician. And in some cases, we want the claimant to bring their own, or the applicant to bring their own person but then that and that has a whole barrel of monkeys open that way too. So it's it's difficult. That's why it has to be replicated and replicated, and you control as much as you can. This, Try to be as fair as you can to the claim, yeah. the applicant. This the, the the claim here was one that I rate is relatively hard to to test. Um, it was not a it wasn't a slam dunk to figure out how to actually do the test. Anybody else? Real quick, one yeah. clarification on your last slide, just with the number stuff. I'm glad you showed the slide, by the way. Because um, he really wanted to. <laughs> probability of failure of reduced power by chance. Yes. Do I take that as, for example, if somebody uh, on average can shoot 9 out of 10 free throws in any single in any single if, it, if if the test was uh, how many free throws can they hit out of uh, nine? They're going to shoot nine free throws, and they've got nine out of. Uh, and in order to quote pass, they have to hit on eight of them, and they can do it nine out of ten times. There's a twenty-three percent chance that they won't get. Eight out of nine. That's what. It, that's the statistic I computed. I've always been a little bit ambivalent towards tests, uh, such as you know the challenge of Randy's test and so on. Uh, it has unbelievable um, uh, propaganda value, I'm sure, and uh, you know it fits in with the. American idea of put up a shut up, okay? On the other hand, I have my ambivalences that um, it's very difficult to do these things in a really fair way. Um, the tests are set up, when they, when they go to get their million dollars, by the way, but they pass the first phase, uh, they will not have a 2% uh, chance just by ch luck. They will use uh, as they always do. They'll set up so that I know I, I, I help plan some of these tests sometimes in the past. They have a, a criterion such that it's only one in ten thousand or one in a million 
I was on the Randy show, a uh, show that was featuring Randy called Testing Psychics Live. That was 1989, I think. It was the first year of the Fox Network. And uh, this was a two hour show. Bill Bixby was the host. And the premise was that psychics would challenge Randy. I would, was a guy who had arranged a test that could be done on television within the parameters of that, which is very tricky. And I, I'd have to get them to agree to the test that was fair and we were going to carry it out the way it was. And if they passed the test, they were going to each get um, $100,000, okay? The, um, so it was set up that I think they had one chance, just by luck, they had one chance in 10000 to succeed by luck, okay? Just before the show was to go on, the producer who was in charge of giving the money out, he was alarmed that they might have to give some out. So he said, you gotta change the odds. I want it to be one in a billion. Uh, I says, first of all, one in 10,000 is still pretty, it doesn't give them any chance at all to win. There's no possibility that they could win, even if they had the powers, uh, almost perfect. They have to be absolutely perfect to win. And uh, none of them claim to be absolutely perfect. Uh, so, but you get into that kind of hassle. And this is where uh, Jerry's talking about how to be fair. You gotta be fair to both sides to some extent. They gotta have a chance to be realistically display the power if they have it, uh, without demanding it to be absolutely perfect. Uh, although some some will claim to be perfect, and maybe they ask for it. if they claim to be perfect, uh, then then it's easier to set up. You can demand to be absolutely perfect. But still, even if they you claim they'd be absolutely perfect, you still have to, uh, with odds of uh, one in 10,000, it's almost impossible, it's very difficult to set up a test which in real time would give them a chance to really succeed. They're almost, so, so um, yet on the other hand, since it's a prize trade, and also the most important part of doing a test like this is to show the public that this doesn't work, all you have to do if you keep doing tests like this, one one person eventually, even if you get very low odds, just by luck is going to get it, right? You give a rare event enough chance to happen, it's going to happen. So eventually, if people keep doing these tests, and you have IIG and other people doing these tests, and they're trying to be fair, they run them fairly, at some point, some of these people just by chance are going to succeed, okay? And then, all hell's going to blow, blow loose. They won. The psychics have, have won. Finally, they, they proved to the, to the to the world that they're successful. Now, I don't have, I don't have answers. I'm just saying that this is a you know sometimes I worry about this. I well I'm not going to worry too much about it. But yes yes okay Jim say give the other side. I, I am going to give the other side. I, um, I I don't think it's unfair at all to ask them to do whatever they're claiming to do. There, I mean, our, our two, uh, Randy's test and our test are both two-part tests. When applicable, and, and probability isn't always applicable, but when applicable, the preliminary demonstration they have to do, it's, it's 5,000 to one chance, and then million to one if they get past the first one. No one's ever made it past the, the 5,000 to one. Um, but if this is what they say they can do, this isn't like, you're not asking someone to hit a roulette wheel. Uh, that would be a fairness issue. You're testing someone who's making a claim about a skill that they possess. So now the fairness just lies in what they say they can do versus are you testing what they say they can do? We had someone come down from Seattle who said he could telepathically transmit 47 out of 52 playing cards. The, the odds are way off the charts to get 47 out of 52. This guy actually started out by saying, I could do all 52. And I said, give yourself a little re leeway. So we said I could do 40, 47. And you know, he got zero out of, <laughs> out of 52. But that's what he said he could okay, do. Okay, what if he got 46? <laughs> that's my nervous. Yeah, and listen, if he would have gotten 10, it would have been in the hundreds of thousands. Okay. 
But, but the, you know, that's a fair answer you gave here. But, uh, and if, as some do, they, they claim they can do 100%, for example, that, that so many of the people we, te we tested, I am not sure, I think it was six people we finally tested on the, uh, the show, the two-hour show with Randy. Um, and uh, they all had, they all, at the end of the show, we interviewed them all. They all, all unfortunately failed. For them. Unfortunately for them, they had failed. Um, I think Randy was hoping that this was going to be a pilot for a, a series he was going to have. Every week he had testing psychic powers live, and every week the psychics would lose, right? I had some doubts about how successful such a series would be because you always know ahead of time they're going to lose, right? <laughs> Bashing the psychics. Uh, but anyways, that, I think Randy had a hope that that would be turned into a series. But it's, it's hard to make a, uh, an interesting series if, the, if you know, uh, it's program after program, the psychic always loses. So, uh, what's that? I'm sorry? Bashing the psychics, okay. I don't even think that they wanted to bash the psychics, but they want to give their testing. But, but th these are interesting questions you have to think about.